Thank you for being a friend Travel down a road and back again Your heart is true You're a pal and a confidant I'm not ashamed to say I hope it always will stay this way My hat is off Won't you stand up and take a bow Good morning. Uh, welcome to Breakfast Blend 2020. I'm Christopher Brown with the next group of companies. I'm your Associates chair, Council Chair for this year, and we've got an exciting topic to talk about this year. Uh, this is our third Breakfast Blend of the year. Uh, normally we do two. We're able to add in a third one this year, and this should be a fun topic. We're going to talk about new homes in 2021. Obviously, we could none of us could have predicted what, <laughs> what came about this year, uh, and we're all kind of adapting and, and figuring out how uh, homes evolve, how our lives have evolved this year, and how that affects the homes that we're going to uh, build into 21 and on and beyond that. Uh, so this should be a fun conversation today. I wanted to take a brief moment and thank our sponsors, uh, Arc Document Solutions, Blue Mountain Construction Services, Chase Home Mortgage, Eagle Roofing Products, O'Hagan, Safe Credit Union, and Wood Rogers. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand it off to my good friend Terry with TST Inc. And she is going to lead this conversation with a great group of speakers, and we should have some fun today. So, Terry, off to you. Great. Thanks, Chris, and welcome, everybody. Good morning, and um, happy, what is it, Thursday today? I think it's Thursday. Um, well, first of all, thank you for, for having me and for asking me to host what's going to be a great conversation. I think uh, probably the reason that I've been asked to do this is because back in April, myself and two partners, Don Ruthroff at Dolan was one of them, funded and launched a study that we called the America at Home Study. And it was the only study of its kind, we know, that was done nationwide at that point in time to test how people were thinking about life and work and school from home. Um, so by mid-April, mid we were about six weeks into the pandemic, full lockdown mode in most parts of the nation. And I grew personally really frustrated because everything I read and heard and watched in the news is all talking about the impact on small business, hospitality, travel tours, and the airlines. And nobody was talking or asking consumers about what they thought about life from home when we were all living at home. So uh, we have some really great, I think, insights to share with you this morning and some really talented speakers. So I'm gonna ask each of them to introduce themselves first. We have two architects and two home builders. So let's start with you, Bert. Good morning, thank you, Terry. I appreciate it. Uh, as she mentioned, I'm Burke Baer with BSB Design. We are a national architectural firm uh, we are based out of Des Moines, Iowa, but our office here in Sacramento is located in Gold River. And we've been here just uh, since about 2012. We reopened our office, but uh, prior to that, we were here for a number of years, 10 plus in the Sacramento area in El Dorado Hills. And we provide services from single family housing, apartments, and commercial design. Great. And Don, over to you, please. Hi, everybody. Don Ruthroff, Principal at Dahlin Architecture Planning. Um, we are a national and international firm based out of Pleasanton, just, just about 60 miles to the, to the east there in, in the East Bay of the Bay Area. Um, we have four offices up and down the West Coast, west coast and um, we do 
a whole bunch of different things. I like to say everything that involves a bed that isn't a prison or a hospital, we probably do it in our firm. So, <laughs> Excellent. Thank you, Don. And, and Linda, if you'd please introduce yourself this morning. Yes, Linda Schwartz, uh, Director of Sales and Marketing with Tim Lewis Communities. Tim's a private builder who's been building for over 30 years now. I've been with him for about half that time. Uh, he's expanded from uh, move up only to uh, anywhere from entry level all the way up to the very high end. And this past year, we certainly have seen um, a much broader scope in, in what we're doing. We build from the Bay Area, uh, based out of Roseville, all the way up to Reno, Nevada. Excellent. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, uh, Mike, if you'd please introduce yourself as well. Uh, hi, everybody. Good morning. Mike Paris, President of Black Pine Communities. Uh, we are a private builder, uh, focused from the Sacramento area and, and have been around since uh, 2010 uh, and look forward to the conversation today and sharing what information I might have that's helpful. Great, thank you. So quick reminder, if anyone has any questions for the panelists while we hear their presentations and their point of view this morning, please just pop them into the Q&A box and we'll have a look at them and answer them as we go. Or if it makes more sense, we'll collect them and answer them at the end. But let's, we like to make this as interactive as we possibly can. So um, Burke, let's start with you. Can you share uh, your screen and share some new ideas and some new design insights that the team at BSB is, is exploring now post COVID? I can do that. Excellent. All right, I think we will uh, have, there we go, let's get rid of that. There we go. So what we're seeing is on the single family side that we see uh, the, the space that is in the floor plans is very crucial on how it's laid out and how it interacts to each other. And we've found out that, and we all know that we're all experiencing a time where people uh, such as this were on Zoom calls. Everyone here is on a Zoom call. And so they might have kids or uh, a partner that are also trying to do a Zoom call or doing homework or schoolwork in another space. And we touched a little bit on this in our previous breakfast blend, but we're seeing more and more how this is evolves and how people are, are interacting. People are getting out of the dining room table and into other spaces. It might be a bedroom. Uh, recently, we were involved in a study that uh, a man would go out and work in his wife's car in the morning so his wife and his daughter could sleep, and then he would come in and work into the home. And so trying to find those spaces in the home to where we can be separated but connected is, is very crucial at this time. Uh, outdoor living space can't be more important right now. It, it used to be the, the, the getaway was go out to eat, well, we still can at some level, but go out to eat, go out and visit, just to get out of the house. It was always, I need to get out, I need to get out. Well, right now we really can't get out that well, but we can outside our house. If we have a, a nice porch or a nice patio or courtyard, uh, we can get out and, and relax and, and detach a little bit from the inside of our confinement. And then having some sort of a, a flex room, if it's a multi-gen, I mean, a lot of homes were built with multi-gen homes. And so now those can be uh, multi-purpose to where it's going to be used as an office space or an exercise room. If you're working at home, you now exercise isn't morning or night. It could be any time of the day where it fits in your schedule. So having room to be able to do your different activities is crucial. And another thing that we're seeing that's coming forward quite a bit and gaining a lot of traction is single family for rent. And that single family for rent is uh, an area that builders can diversify it's a different type of a market group. It's a different portfolio. It's a different revenue source. And what we do there is we, we same single family, you have flexibility, your square footage are a little bit smaller. So you're able to get more units on a, a piece of land, have storage for, for those that have some things they've collected along the way. And then having those spaces that would lure apartment renters, such as the outdoor spaces. You can't go outside onto a patio and enjoy a backyard in an apartment as you would a single family home. So we're seeing a lot of people who would not necessarily be able to afford a down payment, or maybe it's a, a divorce or something changed in, in their life that they're, 
they're not able to be able to lock into that mortgage, but they can and still want to be in a single family home. So we're seeing a lot of traction on single family for rent. Thank you. That's great. And I think um, two points I'd like to just sort of put a point on from your presentation and your content is that firstly, we learned that 46% of people renting today now want to become homeowners as a result of COVID. And the balance who do still want to remain renters, probably no surprise to the folks on this call, the vast, vast majority of them preferred single family for rent detached living. And we have all that information and insights by different groups and it's pretty interesting stuff. So, um, so thanks very much, Burke. So Don, let's toss it over to you and, and ask you to share some of your insights that you may have um, sort of taken cues from and some new design inspiration as a result of your work in the last few months. Sure, Thank, thanks, Terry. Um, and thanks, Burke, that, that's great. That's mm -hmm. great insight from you guys. Um, so this, this slide just, and I've, I've taken the time to just kind of capture kind of the, what I call the top of fold um, statistics out of the study. These are things, um, if you've seen any of the articles we've written around the study in Builder Magazine or in Forbes, um, these, these statistics are out there, but they, they're all worth revisiting. We, the study was um, 3,001 households um, responding to um, the survey. And as Terry just pointed out, pointed out 46% um, of renters now want to own. And that's, that's a huge, huge, huge number. Um, so I think really important and why we start kind of with this big piece up in the, in the top corner is 91% uh, of people look at their home as a safe space. And I think that's, that's really important for us to remember as designers and home builders, people are looking um, at, a, at their homes as, as a place to be safe from, from an environment and, and a world that has been a bit chaotic this last year, as we all well know. Um, eighty-five percent look for comfort, and eighty-four percent are, are look at it as a space for family. Um, those are those are big numbers. Those families um, have various formations and various various shapes and sizes. So you know, it's all about creating flexibility for our home buyers and creating spaces that they can make their own. So if I kind of look at some of the some of the things we found in the study, um, one of the things is people want a space when they come home um, that they can easily kind of wash up and, and enter the home um, clean from being outside. So this is, these plans are actually, and I'll, I should take a moment and, and talk about that. These, this plan typology that I'm, I'm using to demonstrate this is actually a plan we designed several years ago. Um, it, well, in the last five years. Um, so this is not a house that was designed specifically, or these are not homes that were designed specifically to respond to the survey. But what I'm doing here is I'm showing ways that in this time when, you know, we already have um, typologies in the field, you're already building projects. Um, these are things you can point out to home buyers that address some of their concerns coming out of the survey. So one of the things is when they come home, they want a, the ability to wash up right away. Well, this particular plan has um, on the on the arrival sequence from the garage, there is a bathroom right here, which is an inconvenient way for someone to come in, just go in there, wash up, um, and then move into the house already ready to, to greet the inhabitants of, of home. Um, we've been talking about the, the new front porch. You know, we, we always talk about front porches. Um, as architects, we love them. Um, but the, we, we talk about the new front porch as kind of that public living room. This is that space where you can greet people that maybe aren't part of your residence, um, family, and not, not part of your inner circle, but you still want to greet them, interact with them, and socially distance from them while while being them so a big front porch that that allows for that so space that's furnishable um, where you can have those kind of conversations is really important the other thing we hear is as Burke pointed out the importance of of outdoor space but that outdoor space needs to be private so I, I would just point out so this this unit here in the front has this detached garage back here that happens to be attached to this one but um, this private space 
is very well protected. So we think about this as designers. None of the windows of the adjacent units look into this private space for this unit. So that creates that sense of privacy that people are looking for, even in a more dense um, context of this floor plan. The other thing we heard a lot about was millennials are converting their garages. Gra the garage has become that new extra space, and we're looking at ways that you can take um, part of this, so you could still park in part of it, and then create the other part as a gym or as a play space or as a workspace. In this case, create an opening here that might open it onto here and create that California room that maybe in this more dense environment you wouldn't normally have, but you, you would still have the opportunity to have in this um, particular situation. So then if we look kind of at the second floor, again, there's some more statistics here on the side. Um, uh, more than 50% of our, of our home buyers want germ-resistant countertops and floorings. We think that is really talking about solid surfacing, things that are non-porous, um, so maybe less stone, maybe more quartz, um, those kinds of shifts, not necessarily um, built-in germ resistance like antimicrobial um, but the other thing is touch-free faucets and touch-free touch water closets those are high on people's list as they're thinking about home um, and then down here um, huge majority want a detached some sort of detached home and you know i would point out that that these while they are dense are are basically detached they're designed to operate as detached units that while they are attached in a very kind of small way so it's it's creative solutions like that and creative solutions like on a second floor um, if this is their open space it needs to be sized appropriately it needs to be big enough that they can live on it and utilize it and i think i will stop there because that's about the end of my of my time for that portion of the day. How's that? That's great. So a couple of things I heard and I want you to pay attention to from both Burke and Dawn. So hygiene and safety equals new. That's really a huge benefit for all of us on the call involved in this home, new home construction space and community design and development. Safety and hygiene equals new. We heard flexibility and adaptability of space, more important than ever before. That's very intuitive, clearly, but I think there's some interesting ways we can talk about that. And we also heard the importance of the garage is really kind of the garage and sort of outdoor private porch balcony spaces as working harder than just the typical utility spaces, but really now becoming places where life happens. So Linda, I'd like to go to you next. So that's really great insight from the data, but I know that you at Tim Lewis does, you do a lot of research and insight with your own home shoppers and home buyers. So I'd love to hear what you're hearing on the ground, if you could help us with that. Sure. Um, again, to uh, Don and Burke's point, I think they hit those big macro things that we are hearing. Um, buyers are now home, uh, many of them with their children, and so those home office spaces are more important than ever. Uh, the children, not so much. Uh, they're still very comfortable with the children working in that kitchen island space, but because they're both at working at home at the same time, they need some privacy. So really looking at ways that we used to keep, you know, open dens were, were very popular for a long time, but we're needing to adjust now. Um, luckily, a trend these days is barn doors, which adds a great option to be able to create that privacy for mom or dad, still keep an ear open and, you know, check in on the kids. And then the other um, thing that we've really seen as of late that has made us rethink some of the things in our home is uh, that uh, existing those uh, city areas, specifically Bay Area, our tech industry is coming to us because they can now work remotely from home. So really looking at those office spaces, they're a little more adaptable. Um, we have several uh, Twitter and um, Facebook buyers who don't necessarily need the um, den space as we know it, an actual study, um, but technology in the home obviously is key, making sure that uh, you have several people uh, sometimes streaming at the same time. So that's become a real focus. Um, and then those outdoor spaces, extremely important. Uh, even in a workday, people just need a break. They need to be able to walk out to that, be it small patio or big backyard, whatever it is, 
this has become our living area. So really thinking that through and, and making sure that we're extending, bringing the outdoor mm -hmm. in and vice versa so that people are able to, you know, get out during their work processes. Um, I think, I think those are the main issues, uh, looking to pr provide some privacy in the den spaces. Uh, they do say that the older children still want to work in their rooms. The younger children, they want to keep in open spaces. High school and above, they're still seeing them work in their uh, bedrooms. So just adapting those bedroom spaces to be a little larger to accommodate maybe a desk space as well as their bedroom furniture. Okay, great. That's, a, that's really good insights around the indoor outdoor space too. And then again, I think as well, thinking through the different use of space depending upon the age of the children. Uh, you know, there's really kind of no one size fits all. And if we've learned anything from this pandemic, I think it's the need to continue to be flexible and to really stay open to whatever comes. Uh, Mike, we'd love to hear from you. What are some of the changes that you're seeing at Black Pine in this new normal, I guess? Um, well, first, I, I'm not accepting the new normal. I think okay. for our people are getting pretty, pretty tired and fed up with some of the changes. And, and unfortunately, the paradigm shift is probably for good. Uh, I, I would probably want to shift a few of my comments over toward um, looking at the community as a whole and going beyond the house as just the single element of the lifestyle that's being uh, looked at. We certainly all of us have seen a pretty strong uh, influence from other metropolitan areas, specifically the Bay Area, and there's a reason for that uh, that's finally transpired. But in some respects, I think what we're seeing now in the housing markets are, uh, it, it, in some respects, it, it accelerated what we've already known in, in, in a lot of ways. Uh, luxury is being redefined as wellness, and so we're looking at the same lifestyle, but in a different definition. Uh, some of the comments, I, I would mirror exactly what we're seeing as well. But I think, I think acro level, higher level, I think we're valuing our adult spaces a little more. And we're looking for a little bit of separation for private and adult versus common area spaces. And, and looking at how the community as a whole integrates into the lifestyle. For example, able to carve out small areas within the community for a dog park. Uh, looking at ways that people can get out and garden within their own area or even in a common space or a street median and and how it connects with the, the street and the connectivity. Uh, I think front porches in, in that social aspect are going to take a higher priority as well. Um, we're learning that a large home isn't necessarily a better home and I think that's important to look at as we also uh, plan our, our, our future communities going forward. I love that. Those are really good insights. And I think the point you made at the beginning is something we all need to think about as well. And that's that the pandemic is a disruption. And I like the way you phrased it, Mike. It's not really a new normal. It's, it's a paradigm shift, right? But it's what was already in play. And disruptions don't cause trends to just pop out of nowhere. Disruptions like what we've just experienced and are still experiencing really kind of amplify trends that were already in place. So from a macro sort of economic perspective, things like digital shopping, you know, virtual everything, that was already in play, right? We just saw that amplified on steroids. So some of the same changes you've talked about in terms of community design, um, I think we're in play. And, and I think one of the ways you can think about it is, is health equals wealth now, right? Wellness is a, is a sign of, 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 of kind of, you know, a, a good successful life as opposed to a big giant home potentially. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we have a question that I'd like to throw to somebody at this point. So the question is, and maybe it's appropriate for you, Mike, as sort of more community developer, are these types of subdivisions widening streets to allow for street parking? This would allow adaptations to garage spaces. Anybody seeing that in your area or your market area? You know, it, it, uh, it, it, interesting question because uh, I'm working on a community right now where the city has actually encouraged one car garages. So I think there's a new dynamic developing based upon some of the culture within the city's own ordinances and where they're trying to go with respect to uh, either being all, all electric within a certain time period or not. Uh, two car garages uh, come in a premium on the higher density programs if you can use that. Mm -hmm. but 
you know, I personally don't like to see cars on the streets. So I try and look at putting in our communities ways that people will utilize their garages. Now, if we've got this dynamic building where garage space is now part of the, the lifestyle activity, it's gonna change things up a little bit. Hmm. Anybody else have experience with that from a jurisdictional perspective? Maybe Don, do you have any comment there? Well, yeah, I was just going to say, so, so we're always, we're forever trying to be creative with where we put the cars. It, it drives, as, as we all know, drives design from the beginning. We, we start with where are the cars going. So we're always looking for creative ways. And it is that, that uh, you know, are there ways to create a, a, a driveway apron and a, and a garage space and then utilize the, that other space next to it for something more for the, for the homeowner storage and another space. And, you know, it's always about, doesn't have to necessarily be on the street because, you know, we, although that's really nice for guests, you want, you want them to be able to show up and know where to park. But, um, you know, it's all those creative ways, a, a, a parking bay next to the garage in an alley condition that's open, you know, in addition if, where we can't have like a full apron behind the garage door. All those kinds of creative solutions solutions are, are in play fully now uh, in community design because at some point and depending on who you listen to the car the uh, the personal vehicle is probably going to start to disappear so you know I think you know it's as we build communities now that bridge this gap into this new space that we don't all know what the definition is yet we still have to be thinking about how might it look um, in 30 years if the if the car has disappeared as as our main mode of transportation yeah that's a great perspective and i think we can all probably agree that the garage and again this just the trend has been amplified the garage is much more than a place to park the car right yep. it's become it's become another space of in where, where life happens beyond just storage um burke i want to sort of ask your opinion on on one topic that i think is really important especially in the bay area i mean certainly and that's the notion of attainability so we've heard a lot of things from, from you all this morning around new areas of priority in the home, new types of design solutions. How do you address all of this and still try to maintain some sense of attainability in the home itself? I, I think two things. I think one comes down to the, the, the home has to be purchasable. I mean, the, the price has to be at a point to where people can obtain that, that, that home. And so I, I feel that the designing right and designing not an like Mike had mentioned, uh, not an overly sized home, a smart sized home, and so that we keep that cost where it, is it still obtainable? And I know lumber is through the roof right now, so it, it's difficult. And fees that are get uh, tacked on by the city and developmental fees are huge. And so being able to come up with homes that are right sized to keep those prices down. I think is one way. Another way I, I firmly believe is in the customer service that the, the home seller provides that person is the experience that they go through. If someone walks through the door of a sales office and they say, hi, welcome. Um, the door's over here. Feel free to visit our models. And they send them on their way. And it's how do you approach each person that comes through there? And what is that type of experience that that person receives as they buy that home? I think we'll go a long ways into someone being able to make something attainable for themselves. I mean, we all, if there's something that we desire, something that we want, we go out of our way to figure out, okay, how do I get that? I'm going to change things in order to get that. And so if, if there's an experience that someone really enjoys and the product is there that is designed correctly and is at the best competitive pricing as it can be, I think the attainability will, will come, uh, by itself. Okay, great. Um, Linda, can you tell us about some specific solutions, specific design solutions that you've put in play um, in some new new homes that you're creating with, with Tim Lewis at this point, based on the insights you've heard? Certainly. First, to Burke's point, we'd never send you that way without taking your temperature first, Burke. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to that point, it really has changed that the biggest thing we miss, I think, as humans these days is the interaction, right? We mm. can we can do this all day long, but it's not the same. And so we have worked, um, not to go off course here, but very hard with our salespeople to create an experience 
Um, although it's digitally, a lot of the time, put your face on that conversation with your customer. Let them see, you know, who you are and um, interact, not just uh, when you do a tour show, showing them the home, but show yourself showing them the home, right? They, they still need that interaction. They still need that validation. And again, what it has done is allowed us um, from a virtual standpoint to rethink how we provide information, how we man our customers with what they need to feel good about making the decision. And so I think those are the, the positive things that going forward, when, when this is behind us, and it will be at some point, it really will, um, we will still be doing business better than we did before this because we've learned a lot in, in what we can do for customers and how important that interaction is. So to that point, what have we done differently? Well, one of the most exciting things, and, and uh, Burke spoke to it early on, and I think maybe Don hit it as well, is uh, rooftop depth, uh, where you can to be able to, you know, medium density is tough, and you may be able to give them that little grilling area, as uh, one of the diagrams showed. But having a rooftop deck, you know, you, we're really uh, able to utilize something like that in this area, certainly, uh, a good portion of the year. Um, the other thing is thinking differently. We used to see a small loft space and, you know, push back and that really isn't enough room. But is it enough room for a desk? Is it enough room for a, a bicycle, a treadmill, a, a, a physical um, exercising space? It doesn't take much, but now you're providing somewhere something that they didn't have before. Mm -hmm. um, so even sometimes a master bedroom will allow for that with just a little niche or something built in there. So just really rethinking those spaces that you might have overlooked otherwise and seeing how much of a function they can provide in the home today. I love that. That's awesome. And that's so, so critical. Every piece of space in the home and the community needs to matter, needs to work really hard. Mike, there's a question from the audience I'd like to address to you. This is from Chris uh, Dickinson. The question is, we agree that community space and project amenities are a premium, specifically for us, dog parks and covered communal spaces. Curious if there are thoughts on the top project amenities buyers want going forward. Uh... Dog parks top the list, no question. Okay. And also are finding a lot of interest in community garden spaces. Uh, and that's a, that's a, a year round activity that's sh shared very, uh, very commonly within the community. Um, and I think the other, the other area is just having some spaces to, to, uh, for people to gather on the social aspect in, in the communities. And a little bit has to, to do with, you know, where the location is, but certainly uh, small park areas or small uh, uh, picnic tables and things like that are very common as well. I don't think it needs to be, um, you know, looking at the community as, a, as just an extension of somebody's backyard, but, but just shared spaces is equally acceptable today. So you made a comment earlier in your previous remarks about the notion of smaller spaces, smaller scale community spaces, rather than sort of what may have been larger, maybe more built amenities in the past. Is that a, is that a trend that you are seeing and perhaps embracing or what's your opinion there, Mike? I think people have come to the realization that uh, their home is going to be a much longer horizon for them. We're looking at people that are acquiring homes today that are taking a longer term and, and I think it'll be interesting to see how this trend plays out with this work from home notion. But a large house isn't necessarily utilized. I mean, I have a home where I've got rooms that I have, don't think I've been in in over a year and a half. So <laughs> I think we're revisiting how we live in these homes and how they become more functional. Um, and I also think that uh, we're seeing people that are willing to invest in their home with higher quality materials and finishes that are more durable and, and certainly have a lot more life, lifespan to them as well. Excellent, that's really good. Makes great sense. Um, Don or Burke, this is one for either or both of you and it's a question again from the, from the, uh, from the audience. So this is with respect to air quality. When we can't get outside, when the air quality is poor, outdoor space really doesn't do much for us. What are we doing to help improve indoor air quality? 
Oh wow, there's there's a whole there's a whole cadre of things in in there. <laughs> they're super technical and 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 I won't even I won't even try other than to say there's um there's plenty of uh, there's lots on the filtration front um and then there's a lot on the on the electronic you know electron both both passive filtration just through filters and then then electronic filters and and all that stuff um and then we bring in now the days you know it used to be the exception to bring in fresh air into the hvac system that is is on every house now um that's not uh, that's not a it's not a an option it's something we we provide really as a as a matter of course so there's there are tons of things to do about about quality of air that is kind of the new um one of the new to to Mike's point about um, health being the new kind of wealth, that's one of the big things that um, behind the touchless stuff, the other thing is, is um, air quality. Great. Burke, anything from BSB's perspective that you guys are doing differently or thinking about? I, I think that I mean, everything that, that Don just mentioned, it comes at a, a spec level that is available through a builder and what the homeowner is willing to, per, uh, to purchase, but it is the air filtration. Uh, and I, right now is not a good example, but uh, I have a quiet, cool fan on my home and absolutely love the thing, but haven't been able to use it recently because of all the smoke. Mm -hmm. But it, it does, the home does feel different when you get that fresh, clean air into the home. It, you're, you might have stagnant areas, uh, but having that fresh air makes a huge difference on how just how lively the home feels and how fresh it feels. But I think I do feel that the air filtration technology will evolve to a point to where it becomes like what it is today with circulating fresh air into the home. You know, every almost every HVAC unit has the ability to cycle in fresh air without using air conditioning. And so I, I believe that there'll be some level to where the purification portion of it will then just be added on as a, a small piece instead of a, a big, huge hit right now. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's great. That's heartening. I like that. Uh, Linda, I've got one for you again as well. So is there one area in the home right now that you think is most important? I think it remains the um, open kitchen area. It is the it yeah. is the gathering spot to be open to your great room or, or living space. But again, with with everybody being at home right now, the kids at that island, um, the chef in the kitchen, you know, the it, it's a gathering space. If if you have a young family, um, you still want you know your your eyes on them while they're while they're at home during the day. And if you are um, single or or um, without children or the children are gone, you you want an entertaining area, you know. So it is still that that large open area. I would say that we have focused a little more on uh, owner suites and their bath. I think people need that let down. They need that area and, and it doesn't need to be a bathtub. It, it very likely is a, is a larger shower, but it's an escape area to just really uh, take a break and, uh, and let down. And so I think those are two of the areas that we continue to focus on. That's great. And one of the things we learned in our study was that we asked the question about kitchens in a number of different ways. And the number one, number one desire or preference for kitchens going forward were kitchens that function better for cooking at home. So it really wasn't the show kitchen that we've all you know, seen and done many times. It was a kitchen that functions so that you can cook better and eat healthier at home. Uh, we have a question also from the audience from Holly. Are kitchen desks coming back? Anybody? Uh, I think they, oh, go ahead, Linda. I was just gonna say that um, we are finding, and I think one of the diagrams showed it, we are incorporating some um, flex spaces off the kitchen uh, that do have the ability to have a desk area. Um, we used to call it, you know, where you'd put out your cookbook and whatnot, but today it's another private space for Zooming. Um, so I, I, I can see desks being incorporated again. They didn't used to be very functional. I think that's one of the key things we have learned over the years is that function is key. 
So if you do it, you know, make sure that it is a, a functional space. Yeah, one of, one of the things I've been playing with is is a space sort of the size of that walk-in pantry that is behind the kitchen that we can offer in several ways. Might be the dog wash area because if it if we position it so it's on the outside wall and you could have access to the outside, you could have bring the dog in and do a dog wash area there for a, for a homeowner or they could use it as that office, that extra office space because it could have a door and a window and be a nice space to be in and have that Zoom conversation or it could be that pantry or or some combination of those things together. I, for me, it's about how do we create spaces that are flexible and can change and are easily easily option for the builder because you guys don't want to manage a really complicated option. But if it's a space that you can offer just a different finish in, that that gives you the ability to give them the flexibility but without it being a headache for for you guys. So Don, I want to ask you the question that comes up a lot that you talk about and you've taught me to think differently about, which is closets in the yeah, second closets in the secondary bathroom, <laughs> secondary bedroom. Yeah, I I have I've been on a crusade uh, nearly ten years now, um, and and I talk about it this way: when we all sit down together and design a house, builders and and architects and marketing professionals and and mar and merchandisers we all talk about bedrooms and we we pick where the bed's going based on our merchandising needs right we've all had this conversation you have to open the door and you have to see the foot of the bed you can't walk into the side of it you can't and and our so we design the room in a specific way and part of that design process i put a strip closet in based on where we're putting the bed right we that ends up i make that decision as part of the design and there are so many things now that people can go out and purchase. We could be more European. I know some in some areas that's a that's a naughty thing to say, but we could where you in, where you deliver the room as a room and they can purchase a wardrobe. We can show them that in the model, but it gives them the flexibility. Maybe they're like me. They grew up in a house where my bed was under the window, and they're not merchandising the room, so they don't care that the bed's under the window. Where our professionals in the merchandising industry want, you know, they want to have a headboard and they want to have all the stuff that goes behind the bed, so we don't want to put it in front of the window. But give them the flexibility to arrange the room in a way that would be different than we would picture it in a model um, through just getting rid of that strip closet. You know, if you want to build a walk-in closet, okay, that's that's a different animal and, and I fully support that, but strip closets, I think it's time to be done with them in my <laughs> never to be humble, humble opinion. <laughs> Haven't found a builder that's ready yet, by the way, still looking. <laughs> Listen to Linda's comment though about the <laughs> bedrooms and the age of the child. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. yeah, I thought about it when she was talking about that. <laughs> Mike, here's another one for you from the audience. Um, are buyers interested in minimizing their home's carbon footprint? That's the first part. And the second part is, are buyers interested in electric vehicle ready homes? What are you finding in your community? Uh, I'm not an expert on carbon footprint, so I'm not certain I can provide an intelligent response. I, I think probably the best answer I could give to that is I think people are more conscientious of that. And it's certainly on, on the forefront of a lot of dialogue today. Uh, you know, how often do you read about blackouts and, and fires and all these other aspects here, especially on the West Coast? So I think it's going to take a, a center stage going forward and it's going to accelerate as well. Uh, Great. Back to, um, you know, uh, I think you, the question was about electricity and, and uh, batteries. I'm, I'm sorry. Yeah, electric vehicles. Are you seeing interest in EV ready homes from your buyer? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, we, I mean, it's certainly the, the, the market's moving in that direction where builders are going to hopefully have more competitive and more uh, price flexibility with respect to adding those things in. But uh, I'm working on a community right now where we're actually uh, in, in, in going to be involved in installing that in, in the project. Um, I think Don had mentioned earlier, you know, the car and how we use cars and how the cars we have is certainly going to change as well, which will also lead into alternative energy and sustainable energy going forward. Great. And while we have you, Terry, to... to that point, um, every home 
Oops, I'm sorry, Terry. No, Every home ahead. that we build now, we have a we have a um, EV charging station, and the buyers are static. That's correct. Um, and the next level is is the charging wall. So mm -hmm. I, I think you know, as builders, it's it's going to happen. We we were fortunate to partner with uh, a solar company and made it part of our package um, across the board. And it's actually a, a Tesla EV. Mm -hmm. uh, charging station and they're just ecstatic. They're sexy and they're cool and, and people just really love them. Get really Great. excited about that. Cool. Great. Let's take it one step further. There's a question from the audience. So what about overall fully resilient homes? Battery backup with solar so there's no fuels at all. Anybody seeing any of that taking root yet? Well, we're early certainly, stages. yeah, we're in the early stages. We're certainly seeing the march towards electrification of the home, moving away from natural gas as, as um, induction cooking and other cooking, electric cooking techniques have, have come on and, and really improved. And we've started to see um, the chef community embrace um, induction cooking. And I think that, you know, there, there is no mistaking, much like HGTV influences, what we do in the home building industry, food TV certainly in, in, um, influences what's going on around around food and, and in home preparation. And I think you know we've this march towards electrification is is a part of our DNA. It's a part of the state's energy code, and and we're going to go there. So there's there's no reason for it to not happen. For, you know, I think as, as Linda says, it's early stages, but I think absolutely that's on the horizon. Awesome. Uh, Mike, I have a question for you based on something you said earlier. You talked about, when you talked about community planning overall, you talked about carving out small private areas and, and that you mentioned the connectivity of those areas with your street plan, your street layout. How are you thinking about site planning um, potentially differently, knowing that you, you build in kind of urban edge locations and you build in some pretty dense urban environments. So how do you think of the blank canvas of the land itself and your site planning any differently today going forward? Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know if it's so much differently than what I've thought in the past, but it certainly is more acceptable and it's, and it's certainly uh, more compatible with what a lot of cities are trying to do, which is to get better utilization of their land and, and, their, and their infrastructure that's in place. Uh, I, it, that topic is, has to accelerate in the sense that we're seeing a lot of infrastructure that's not going to be utilized. And how that gets transitioned into housing and, and future land uses will be very interesting to, to look at. But, you know, at a personal level, I like to feel good when you come home. And so I've always tried to design our, our site plans where the front of my home is looking at the front of my neighbor's home. So that there's interaction between humans and, and, and neighbors and, and there's safety and security in, in that knowledge that someone is also looking at your house at the same time and and to don's point you do have to deal with cars and the higher dense you go the more the cars are in the back of the home because that's the only way to access it and, and so i think we look at all those factors going in and try to develop private but yet shared space that is uh, uh, common throughout a community that everybody feels comfortable using Great, and some of those concepts really kind of relate also to home design, don't they? I mean, they oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think the other thing that I'd throw in here is um, the importance of, of walking, the ability to walk a community um, in a in a connected way, we we always are thinking about how do the how do the sidewalks work together so that you can or the or the you know if it's not a hard sidewalk a, a, a hard walking surface that would gives you the ability to walk around a community so that that's become such an important part of of walking the dog and and just getting out of the house particularly in this time when we're all at home you know i know in my own community that's one of the things that drives me a little nuts there are areas where the those things don't fully connect and you end up you know you're in the street or you're doing something else and it's We've, we've thought for a lot of time about um, when we create a community, how those things work together and how there's the ability to use that throughout the community, kind of that passive amenity. Mm -hmm. That's a great point. Here's a question for the, the planners, so probably the architects on the call again. So what are we 
and builders doing to combat the extreme high fire dangers in California? Mm -hmm. um, you know, fire is a, is a constant that's out of our control. How are we addressing that? I, I'll, I'll start on that one. I mean, you know, if you're in the, the city core, there's, there's not much more we do other than just basic code requirements. But as we get out onto the periphery of the, the areas to where we're in the hills, there, there are really requirements we have to do. You, know, we, you have to put in a sprinkler system in every home. You get into fire rating, anything that can collect an ember and then stay there and then ignite, meshes that go over openings, and all those requirements already exist in place. And I don't see right now anything, at least in our area, that is going to change at this point. Uh, I mean, there's other things you can do is go into fire rated uh, sheathing on your roof, just upping the, the, the beefiness of the protection that we're providing. But most of the homes are, are concrete stucco. So it's not an ignitable uh, material. Uh, others have siding, but I, I feel, unless we were, the majority of us were in the hills, uh, we probably aren't going to do a whole lot different than what we're doing right now. I mean, the sprinkler system does a really good job at suppressing a fire once that thing kicks on. Right. Anybody else have a perspective on that to share? It's good, good insight. Yeah, yeah. I would say um, one of those, one of the other things that that is creating that defensible space around the community. So it's it's just making sure that there's there's appropriate management of the of the space around the building. Um, and so that the homeowner can maintain it and keep it in good shape. Great. Linda, anything else from your perspective with respect to site planning and the integration of your homes within your site plans that you can share going forward? No, I think everybody's hit on, you know, just finding spaces. Again, nothing needs to be as large as it used to be. Um, to, to Mike's point, um, gathering areas. You know, small spaces where a couple benches, a couple Adirondack chairs, something that invites the community to to interact, to sit down, have a cup of coffee, a glass of wine, and uh, you know, interact with your neighbor. So I think we we look at that, and again, it it doesn't take as much as it used to because we're looking at it differently. Excellent. Okay, well, we were asked to wrap this before the hour, so I'm going to ask you all one last question, starting with you, Burke. What's the, uh, what's the one word that defines home building and community design in 2021? I think I'd have to say uh, optimistic. I'm excited to see how months, uh, how, we've, uh, how we've evolved in, in a leap of years within a few months because of this pandemic. And I'm excited to see that and I'm excited to see that come into our home designs and our community design. So I'm, I'm optimistic. Great. Okay, Don, if you could, you would in 2021. <laughs> oh gosh, if I could, I would. Um, I, was, I was working on a word. <laughs> you can give me a word, that works. <laughs> uh, no, I like that. If I could, I would. If I could, I would, I would. I would, uh, 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 um, if I could, I would make a home that really embraces the innovation that I see on the horizon for home building. All right. Well, let's see if that happens because that's down the way, isn't it? Might be. <laughs> <laughs> Linda, what is your, um, what is your kind of greatest, most creative wish you have for Tim Lewis and building homes next year? Hmm. What we have on the horizon next year is, um, again, more from a, an affordability stand, uh, standpoint. We are balancing out um, our portfolio at this point. We had a tremendous amount of fun in the last 18 months creating Sutter Park, which is just, uh, it was truly um, a blessing to be a part of uh, the old Sutter Hospital space and um, Stonebridge communities did an awesome job of land planning there. And we were to, uh, you know, put the earrings on the community uh, through architecture and design. And a lot of the things we talked about today are there. Um, so I would say to create uh, that same dream in an affordable space as we have created in these very larger expensive homes, it's all relative to your market. 
so to add that value for the homeowners at uh, every price point is equally as important. And my takeaway word is absolutely flexibility. We have, we've just got to be flexible in our design, in our presentation, in our adaptation. So that would be my go-to word, our takeaway of 2020. Optimism, flexibility, that's great. Okay, Mike, take us home with an answer to the two part, this two-part question. What should we do less of in 2021? And what do you hope we'll do more of? I answer that in reverse. I hope we can do more vacationing. Okay. Uh, I really miss that. So I think that's something. Agree. That we, we, Amen. We, uh, hey, we agree. Learned, <laughs> we, we've learned how important our neighbors are to us all of a sudden. So I think uh, something that I would do less of is probably worrying about trying to control everything uh, and, and just be more. Uh, positive outlook, but also looking at the fact that, you know, we have a very changing culture and society across our country and world that will be, I think, positive, so. Excellent. Well, on that note, very optimistic note, and wonderful panel, great insights. Thank you all for sharing time with us this morning during uh, this breakfast blend. I hope you got as much out of it as I did, and I wish you all a great day and a great rest of the week. Thank you very much. Thank you for being a friend Travel down a road and back again Your heart is true, you're a pal and a confidant I'm not ashamed to say I hope it always will stay this way My hat is off, won't you stand up and take a bow And if you threw a party Invited everyone you knew Well you would see The biggest gift would be for me And the card attached would say Thank you for being a friend 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 If it's a car you lack I'd surely buy you a Cadillac Whatever you need any time of the day or night ashamed to say I hope it always will stay this way my hat is off won't you stand up and take a bow